I think of myself as an optimist, and that's deliberate. Early in my professional career, a man who was extremely wealthy and a very successful person told me that he was an optimist, and every successful person he ever met was an optimist. That might sound obvious, and it did even to me at the time, but I had a hard time taking it on board. I think it's because the higher education process rewards the ability to criticize. And at some point, it can all turn very negative, and I think it gave me a certain disposition about the world that wasn't optimistic, and so it was hard to take on board. Okay, so that might make what I'm about to say sound like a non sequitur, but it'll make sense in the end. I made an early podcast about dialing back politics. And the idea was more finance and economics. We've gone crazy about politics. We could probably afford to dial it back a little bit. I mean, you probably know who you're going to vote for. Okay, are we just trying to make ourselves crazy here, right? I actually got some dislikes on the video. And that really surprised me. And of course, I realized, well, I suggested to people what they should do but I didn't tell them why. And so this is a quick video to run through just a handful of big picture items. When I say we're not going to have a smooth economic future, these are some of the underlying factors that I'm talking about. I'm going to talk about five things. Each one of these are their own subject that I could do an in-depth analysis on and commentary, and I'm sure I will. But right now I'm just skimming the top. At the end, also, I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't let any of this get you down. I'm Ken Bauso. I'm a CFA charter holder. I spent my career on Wall Street and in the financial markets, and I do this podcast to talk about finance and economic issues in a way that can be understood by everyone, even if you're not a financial professional. Please subscribe. We are not going to have a smooth economic future. Don't be the last to understand what's going on. So, as I said, handful of topics. Issue number one. I've previously quoted Stan Druckenmiller because I think he's a brilliant guy and he has a ton of credibility. Like many successful hedge fund superstars, he's always been pretty media shy, but in 2013, he decided to go on a national campaign to talk to everyone about an enormous problem, which is the national debt. Okay, hold on. Don't change the channel just yet. This is the problem. Nobody wants to talk about this. If you Google national debt, you will see that the number is about 22 trillion, and our GDP is about 20.5 trillion, so about one to one. That's relatively elevated, but not so alarming. But that only counts the money that we have already had to borrow. So let's say someone gives me a million dollars to build a house, and I'm going to repay that million dollars in three years from now. Okay, so I borrow the money, I build the house, I haven't yet repaid the money, my own little balance sheet, my own personal little balance sheet will show that the house is an asset and as a liability, I will show that I need to pay a million dollars in three years. And if I discount that at 5% a year, which from an accounting perspective is, is what we do, then it would show something like an $850,000 liability. And each year that liability would go up until we get to the million dollars. Now, if you're the government, you wouldn't have to show any liability because the government doesn't account for future promises, even if the promise is unfunded. So to be more specific, we've got this enormous entitlement problem, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. If we take the present value of all the revenue that we expect to earn from taxes, that by we I mean the government, present value of government revenue in, you know, out into the indefinite future, and the present value of all we have promised to pay, we subtract that from the revenue, and that comes to current present value of our debt is $211 trillion. Okay, now, as human beings, we have a very difficult time dealing with these large numbers. Okay, so let's, so let's just put this into perspective. The U.S. has about 130 million households. $211 trillion divided by 130 million households is $1.6 million per household. That's a present value number. That's equivalent to my 850,000 number today when I owe a million dollars in three years, okay? So it's not, it doesn't mean that every household has to, is gonna have to come up with $1.6 million over the course of the indefinite future. That's how much they would need to pay right now, 
okay? At this point, I'm sure you are thinking I'm doing the math wrong, okay? I'm not, but please do it yourself too. I've seen a lot of these calculations over the years. I've never seen a credible calculation that was less than 125 trillion. So 125 trillion spread across 130 million households is $960,000 per household. That's how much the government has borrowed on your behalf, and that's how much will be repaid with your tax dollars or through some other mechanism, which we can, which we can talk about in the future. Now you might think, well, we'll just stick it to the rich, right? I encourage you to play with those numbers. Again, don't, don't take my word for it, but you will find that the math doesn't work. This is human nature. Politicians of both parties buy votes, they make promises, and they don't stick around to pay the bills. If we understand this, then we can guess that it will continue and that that number, as absurdly large as it is, will grow. In my opinion, that, number's, that number will grow until something breaks. And then what? Stay tuned. I'll talk about it in some future comment. As a side note, how much airtime has CNBC given this issue in the last five years? I would bet you could count that airtime in the minutes, not in the hours. Okay, issue number two. Europe doesn't work. Europe as a whole, it's the second largest economy. It's around the size of the U.S., all the countries combined to make up Europe. But Europe is a political idea, and as a political project, it's been successful. If we can figure out a way to not be a constant war with each other, that's great. <clears throat> Sign me up. I'm all for that. But as an economic idea, it doesn't work, it never has, and the distortions are growing. I think it'll continue to limp along from economic crisis to economic crisis until one of two things happens. One, it breaks apart, or two, the structure changes so that the union becomes much closer economically, if that's even possible. Here's the problem. It's basically a movement of labor, labor problem. In the U.S., the Federal Reserve sets monetary policy for the whole U.S. economy. The U.S. can operate really as one economy, but the U.S. is really a collection of smaller economies, right? In Detroit, the auto business matters a lot. In Silicon Valley, the tech business. Uh, in Manhattan, the financial business matters a lot. In West Virginia, maybe the coal mining business. So even though in the U.S. we've got lots of these small localized economies, we still have a common enough culture that if someone's in Virginia with a family and can't get a job, and there is a job across the country available, that person's very likely to move across the country and get that job and take that job. So in Europe, they have a similar setup. The European Central Bank is just like our Federal Reserve, and they attempt to manage the economy using interest rates. And just like the US, they have lots of different economies, but the person sitting in Greece who can't get a job is much less likely to move to Germany to get a job, which means that it's hard for the whole piece to move as one from an economic perspective. In addition to that, there is no Europe-wide fiscal policy. There is no supranational EU organization where everyone in Europe pays their taxes to that organization, and that EU organization pays benefits to everyone in every country, retirement benefits, unemployment benefits, sets pension age, sets the rules. So, for example, this is what we have in the U.S. In the U.S., we don't really look at it and say, well, New York is paying a lot more taxes in federally than Mississippi is taking out in in federal benefits. We don't really have that debate because we are close enough culturally and economically. Will Europe ever be able to get that close? That's definitely an open question. There is a bit of sovereignty that you're giving up if you're sitting in Italy and you realize that the entity that's going to be determining retirement ages and benefits and all these other rules is not an Italian agency. It's, it's a Europe-wide agency. So I don't know if, if we'll get there. We know Brexit is in the process of happening. I suspect the next 18 to 24 months, the debate about whether 
the debate inside Italy as to whether they should leave the EU will, will probably come to a head again. And the thing about Europe, it's impossible to get all the leaders to agree. And so it's highly unlikely that something dramatic will happen while everything is placid. It's highly unlikely that everyone will agree to a new structure while everything is okay. I think it'll require a crisis. Remember in the US when they introduced a bill, we're in the middle of the financial crisis in 2008. Everything with financial markets were crashing. They, they introduced a bill to bail out the banking system and the politicians voted it down. And then immediately after hours, the S&P was down 10% overnight. They, the politicians came back the next day and they voted the bill through. The EU economic structure doesn't work. I think a crisis is inevitable and that's what it will take to make significant changes. Issue number three. Last time I looked, there was about 16 trillion in negative yielding debt. Up until a few years ago, if you were sitting in a postgraduate class, the brightest financial minds in the world teaching the class all would have told you that this was impossible. Not unlikely, not possible. They would have told you if anyone bothered to ask, but I'm sure almost no one did because the question would have sounded totally absurd and people would have pointed and laughed, negative yielding debt, you idiot. Okay, so what is negative yielding debt? Essentially means I'm paying you to loan you money. Okay. Now, I could do nothing with my money and earn zero rather than paying you to loan you money. If you had a negative interest mortgage, for example, the bank would be paying you to borrow money to buy a house. So here's a chart I saw just before, just before I started filming. This is from Jim Bianco. It shows interest rates in the developed world. The bottom right is the highest number on the chart, and it's the U.S. 30-year rate, and it's 2.03%. You can see that there's a few countries, Switzerland, Germany, and the Netherlands, where you have a negative yield at every single maturity, even from overnight all the way out to 30 years, it's negative and in the red. And it's not just government bonds that are negative yielding. Investment grade bonds and even some high yield bonds are negative yielding. There is a, a, a European bond fund manager quoted in the journal said, investment grade is nuts. About 24% of my benchmark yields less than zero. There are about 2% of European high yield bonds that offer negative yields. It seems crazy there are that many. High yield bonds is, a, is just a nicer term for junk bonds, right? So we've got junk bonds, so-called high yield bonds, some of which, not a, not a large number, but some of which have negative yields. Private companies, not even investment grade rated companies, junk companies. So how did, how did we get here? And what happens when the yields go back to some normal level? The yields got up to negative because the price of that debt went up so much, right? So in order for us to get back to some anything close to some normal level, it means the prices on these $16 trillion worth of bonds will go down. And so the people who own it are going to lose a lot of money. And who does own it? Central banks, the banking system, pension plans? Will we go to negative rates here in the U.S.? Greenspan said last month, there's no reason why not. He said zero is just another number. I think that point is debatable, but that's a topic for a later video. Number four, modern monetary theory, MMT. The phrase I prefer, which I didn't invent, the magic money tree, MMT. This is an idea that's being proposed by serious people, which is pretty amazing. It can't be overstated how much of a departure this is from our current economic system, and it would put the money in circulation directly in the hands of our politicians. Again, suitable for a longer video, but what has happened that we're seriously talking about throwing away our financial system? And, and what will happen if it does happen? What instruments will do great? What instru instruments will get crushed? How do you avoid getting crushed? We'll talk about MMT more later, but to cut to the chase, my prediction, if we do implement MMT, is inflation. Inflation. 
We're not doing so well already. Check this out. Fiat money being broadly used across the world is, is uh, relatively new in history. And if you see this is a graph that shows all major currencies relative to gold, gold is just, is, they're just using gold to show something that's stable. And if you can see, the inflation has showed the value of every major currency over the last 120 years has gone down to you know, some low single digits amount. The US, uh, by the way, is the teal one where you can see in the early 1930s, it takes a steep drop. That's when FDR devalued the dollar versus gold. And then it flatlines until 1971, at which point Nixon formally took us off the gold standard as a temporary measure. Nothing as permanent as a temporary government program. Nixon said he was temporarily suspending the convertibility of dollars into gold. Hey, you know, I shouldn't be too hard on him, right? That was 1971. It's only 48 years ago, so maybe the government just hasn't, hasn't gotten around to uh, reinstating it yet. Okay, issue number five, China. Follow me here. Back in 2005 or 2006, when we were on the cusp of the financial crisis, there was some simple understanding that made clear a big town downturn was coming, and this is it. No matter which way I tried to pick apart any of these theories being thrown around about why something bad was coming or why something bad wasn't coming, it came down to this. Debt cannot grow faster than income indefinitely. Okay, so think about in your own household. If your income goes, goes up by 5% a year and your debt is going up by 20% a year, you can do that for a year or two, five, 10. I don't know exactly how long you can do it, but I know that you can't do it indefinitely. At some point, your debt will be too big relative to your income. And given that we've got, uh, we've got the business cycle, we've got credit cycles, at some point when, you, when this gets really top heavy with debt and you're at the wrong point in the cycle, probably be a big bankruptcy or some kind of restructure. Difficult to know the timing, but let's talk to China, which is what I mentioned. China is a $13 trillion economy with $50 trillion, $50 trillion in debt. They can't grow at 10% while their debt grows at 50% indefinitely. There will be an adjustment, probably be a crisis. I imagine it'll, it will likely involve the Chinese government buying up a lot of bad Chinese private debt, putting it in a drawer and lighting the desk on fire. The currency will devalue, the renminbi peg will drop to some new level, and then, and then we'll carry on. Okay, so those are the five. Here's a few bonus items, just quick ones. Former IMF chief, chief economist says that the Federal Reserve should buy stocks in the next recession. Japan's central bank buys stocks, the Swiss central bank buys stocks, Will the Federal Reserve buy stocks? I think they'll have to change the legislation to do it, but uh, I, think that's, I think that's on the table. In the US debt numbers I talked about, I did not include the woefully underfunded state and local pension system, which if that gets bailed out by the federal government, which I think is reasonably likely depending on which way the political wind is blowing that day, that will add trillions to the federal debt. Uh, there's a respected fund manager who had a story in the Financial Times arguing that central banks should consider giving people money. In the past, central banks set the price of money using interest rates. In the future, it seems, they'll be giving it away. This was an opinion piece. So we've never seen anything in history like this before. And that means you better pay attention. Politics will react to these events. Politics are downstream from these events. So I say all this not to upset anyone, right? I focus on finance here. I don't want to be telling people how to live their lives, but I will mention why you shouldn't let this stuff get you down, right? We should all focus on the things that we can control, which is firstly ourselves, our thoughts, our own emotions. You cannot control the government. You can vote. You can control your own affairs. You can understand the world around you and that will help you plan accordingly. You can have a rich life with family and friends. It doesn't take any money to go outside and enjoy nature. 
Most people in the world are kind to each other. I know it rarely makes the news, but this is the real world that we actually live in. No matter what happens, the sun will shine. We are capable of peace of mind. We'll talk about what to do from an investing perspective in the future. That's more to come. Please subscribe and ring the bell so you'll be notified when I post any new comments. Thanks for listening.